When early automotive engineers smoke crack on the job, we end up with names for critical components that make absolutely no sense, and yet we still use them every day. These are the three worst offenders. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Aussie new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. And of course, I would also welcome your input over other engineering misnomers that I might have omitted here. Jihad on bullshit, captain's log, star date, 97, 89, 83, 79, 73. Work it out if you can. These are the top three worst names ever in automotive engineering. Graphics. The coolant in your radiator, the red stuff, the green stuff, it's not there to assist the cooling. In fact, water on its own would do a far better job just cooling your engine. The most common so-called coolant is ethylene glycol, that's the green stuff, and even the green is fake, it's just a dye. Ethylene glycol has a bunch of interesting properties, but carrying heat out of your engine is not, frankly, one of them. It's only about half as good as water at doing that. Water is actually the commonest heavy hitter of heat transportation. A technically cognizant person, like every mechanical engineer on the planet, for example, knows the specific heat capacity of water by heart. It takes 4.18 kilojoules of energy to heat one kilo of water by just one degree C. And allow me to translate for the non-cognoscenti. Water is effing hard stuff to heat up. It takes a shitload of heat to warm water up just a little bit. Therefore, it's the perfect fluid for moving heat out of something hot, like your engine, and into the radiator where that heat can be rejected into the ambient airflow. Unfortunately, when you mix ethylene glycol with water about 50-50, you actually reduce the ability of the liquid blend to carry heat away from the engine, and that reduction is significant. It's about 25%. The main reason for adding ethylene glycol is to drop the freezing point and to raise the boiling point. That same 50-50 shandy of ethylene glycol and water freezes at about minus 37 degrees C, and it's really good if the water in the cooling system does not freeze because it expands when it does, and that often breaks expensive components from within, as well as rendering the car somewhat undrivable, so that's bad. As a side benefit, together with pressurising the cooling system, a 50-50 blend of ethylene glycol in water, together with 15 psi of pressurisation, raises the boiling point in the cooling system to almost 130 degrees C. It's kind of bad if the coolant boils in the engine because that leads to a generalised class of failures fairly categorised as catastrophic. The other chemicals in the so-called coolant also have nothing whatsoever to do with cooling. It's all about lubrication of the water pump plus corrosion inhibitors for the engine. Different metals close together, aluminium, steel, whatever else, plus water and electrolytes is a recipe for corrosion disaster. And that's bad. So in short, the so-called coolant in your engine not only does not assist in cooling the engine, it actively retards the water's ability to transport heat from the engine to the radiator. It's therefore entirely different reasons that coolant, calling it coolant, is a bullshit expression that we all use in the vernacular today. I hate that. I know exactly what you're thinking. What's he got against cooling systems? And the answer is nothing. I love me a good heat exchanger. Everything from cars to nuclear power plants use heat exchangers. It's just that radiators do not actually cool your engine by radiating. They'd be different if that's how they really work. They'd look different. Heat transfer for dummies, okay? Heat is like water, it flows. Water flows from high to low heights. Heat flows from high temperature to low temperature. That's how this works. Thought experiment time. Imagine placing an ice cube between a stripper's surgically enhanced and thus gravity-defying breasts. Heat is transferred from the relative warmth of the symmetrical silicon chuzzies to the ice cube, which therefore rapidly melts. 
always get permission from the owner of the breasts before trying this experiment literally in the flesh. Trust me, heat flows. There are three mechanisms for the flow of heat, conduction, convection, and radiation. Conduction is like you stick a metal bar, maybe copper or something, into a fire and hold the other end. Eventually, you just have to let go because the end away from the fire heats up by conduction. It's kind of why saucepans generally have insulated handles. Conduction is mainly about heat transfer within solids. Convection is why your head gets cold in the winter when you go bald. Oh, the shame. Convection is all about losing heat into a fluid. Pro tip, fluids are liquids and gases. It's why you rug up in winter. It's why polar bears have big, thick coats. All of that stuff. It helps prevent heat loss into surrounding air. Scuba divers wear wetsuits for exactly the same reason, to block convective heat loss. Radiation is like you're sitting in front of a fire. It feels warm because radiation. Hot summer day, you might go and stand out in the sun. Feels hot. Walk a few feet, you stand under a tree. Instant cooler feeling, right? You've had that even though the air temperature is identical in both of those locations. The leaves in the tree are just blocking the radiation, which has rocketed through the vacuum of space for 500 seconds or something, and that's really the only difference, the leaves blocking that radiation. When you look at a so-called radiator, you can tell instantly that it's not designed to radiate if you're scientifically literate. For starters, it's up the pointy end of the car and they had to hack a big hole in the front of it to facilitate airflow. So that's a big hint. Anything involving airflow and cooling is about convection. If radiators actually rejected sufficient heat by radiating alone, they would not need the big hole in the front of the car. The sun doesn't need any air whatsoever to radiate its heat 150 million kilometers to Earth. If so-called radiators actually radiated effectively, they would not need fans. The fans are only there to maintain airflow when you stop in traffic. They serve no other purpose. And you can look at the design, you know, hot water flows through the radiator, heating up the metal tubes and the fins, and these are designed for maximum surface area, meaning maximum contact with the airflow, convection. Convective heat loss is what a radiator does. Intercoolers are exactly the same thing. They cool by convection. Unfortunately, calling them radiators causes some people to think that perhaps it would be a good idea to paint them black under the false assumption that this will increase their thermal efficiency by boosting heat rejection by radiation. In fact, it doesn't. The paint only serves as an insulator that retards the ability to cool by convection, just like wearing a jumper and going for a run on a hot day. Another bad idea. Because these devices are not radiators. In point of fact, they are both convectors. <laughs> Shock absorber is not the worst name in all of automotive engineering. I just don't know what is. You think about it. You drive over a pothole, right? The suspension droops into the hole and then the leading edge of the wheel and tyre, they crash into the ridge on the far side of the pothole. You felt this. The tyre compresses and then so does the spring. These are the devices that are primarily absorbing the shock. If it's a big pothole and if you hit it hard enough, the suspension will hit the bump stop and the rubber pad there will also attempt to absorb the shock. If it's a really, really big pothole and you hit it really, really hard, you might also bend or break the wheel and that'll also help absorb the shock, but it's probably not that helpful overall when that happens. The one thing that does not help absorb the shock in a significant way is a so-called shock absorber, which is really a vibration damper and hence the more correct alternative name, the damper. So-called shock absorbers are really there to smooth out the subsequent unhelpfully bouncy response of the spring. They don't really do much primary absorption of shocks. This might be hard to figure, I don't know, but it seems pretty simple to me. 
The salient difference between springs and dampers is that springs push back with a force that is related in some way to their displacement. And dumbing this right down, how hard a spring pushes back is based on how far it is compressed or how far it is extended. So-called shock absorbers push back with a force that depends on how fast they're moving. That's a big difference. How far versus how fast. Spring versus shock. You need one device for each to do that kind of response in your suspension. Otherwise, there'd just be one. Maybe this is not so bad. Coolant, radiator, shock absorber. It's really just a disconnect between what they are called and what they in fact do. But if this keeps up, soon nothing will make objective sense. We might all wake up one day in a parallel universe of sorts where two professional ladies, Judy Swallows and Evelyn Sackrider are riding in a cab with Fat Ho after another gruelling day at the cleaners. It's a dirty job, but someone's got to do it. They drop into the local nail salon for a quick... <laughs> really? And then lunch at either... Herpes Pizza or... Mr Piss. That's a tough choice, you've got to admit. Perhaps they will satisfy their hunger with some traditional delicacy. A house specialty at either house. Maybe some swallow balls or... Shrimp flavoured crack, which always reminds Ms. Sackrider of that special conserve her mother used to make. Which really did taste like grandma. And by grandma, I mean... Brownie Shittles, a grand old matriarch, sadly missed. And she could fight too, I mean really fight. Go figure. As the sun sets in Fat Ho's cab, the gals discuss their plans for dinner. Judy Swallows prefers to eat in. She remembers there are, perhaps... Four faggots in the fridge and some leftover soup for sluts with some creamy white finishing sauce. That always goes down so well. Evelyn Sackrider, however, thinks it might be nice to try that new Indian takeaway place right up the back alley. And I guess the only thing that will make that satisfying beaver cleaning day even better is washing it all down with a couple of ice-cold vaginas. If I'm not mistaken, Alice Cooper once wrote a song about that cold ethyl. If that's not worthy of your subscription, I don't know what is. The names of things really do matter. I'm John Cadogan. Please subscribe or I'll be back to washing beavers too. And I assure you that this gets old after the first couple of thousand. Thanks for watching. <laughs>